one thing that I, I learned, and I learned it over the last few years, but it, it really hit me uh, last year, uh, the amount of, of information just scripturally uh, involved in the Christmas story that one really needs to start right after July the 4th or no later than Labor Day to get into the Christmas story to begin to grasp all of it. There is just so much information, particularly if you combine it with the studies from the Old Testament to prophesy about Jesus' coming. And then if you put with it over the history of the church, the things that, that have happened that are about celebrating Jesus' birth, uh, then if you get into the Christmas carols and start looking into to how they came into existence and who wrote them and the words all of them, it, uh, it's hard, you know, and, and uh, my wife never let me turn on the Christmas lights before Thanksgiving was over. You know, Thanksgiving night was when I could turn on all the lights outside. I'd have them all set up, but she said, we're not going to rush Thanksgiving. And I always said, well, the thing to be most thankful for is Christmas. <laughs> but that didn't matter. We didn't turn them on until, so I, I obeyed her even, even though she's in heaven now. I had them don't put up much anymore, just the nativity set, but I didn't turn it on until Thanksgiving evening. Uh, but yeah, there is so much to, but even if you just study the scriptures in Matthew and Mark and put that all together, there is so much information about what we call the Christmas story. And of course, there has been that debate in, in some recent history about, you know, the celebration of Christmas and, and, uh, one of the things that, 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 as I studied, and Michelle helped me do this, my daughter, was to understand its origin and, and, and how it came about. And, uh, and the very word Christ, Christmas, is really Christ Mass. And Mass is celebration. So Christmas is the celebration of Christ. So that, that makes, you know, that makes sense. Well, yeah, let's celebrate Jesus. And then there are so many historical things, and I won't get into that, Maybe in, in a couple of weeks, get in a little bit of it, but some of the, the study of the customs of Christmas, why we celebrate on December 25th, and that goes back to Emperor Constantine in the 3rd century AD. Uh, having a creche or nativity set goes to St. Francis of Assisi at about 1200 AD. The Christmas, the concept of the Christmas tree, and I don't know, I don't, all I have is a ceramic tree now. I don't, I don't put up a tree, but used to all the time. In fact, I would, I would put up the tree. Uh, in, in fact, when I had, had my own downstairs in the basement, I'd leave it up all year long and just turn it on at night so I could enjoy it. But, but the concept of the Christmas tree comes from St. Boniface, so tradition says, in about 700 AD, where he went to a pagan area where they worshiped trees. And anyway, the, the concept was that, that he, he uh, they, they, they cut one down and whatever, and then he wanted to share with them the real giver of eternal life, and, and a, a tree that had died turned green again, and then, of course, we know the story of, of Martin, so he related that to that Jesus is the source of life, and then Martin Luther is the one who saw in a, in a bright, moonlit night, winter, snow on the ground and on the trees, the light glistening in a tree and then that's when he got the concept of the, of the light of Jesus and how it shines. And so the concept of setting up a tree he did and, and all of that. So there's just all those things. Gift giving, of course, that comes from St. Nicholas, a person who actually did exist. Um, uh, wasn't known as Santa Claus, but as St. Nicholas, which was where the concept come from, who actually saw a, a man with three daughters and they were very poor and didn't have a dowry. So he, uh, without letting anyone know, contributed to the dowry. And then tradition says that one of the things, one of the financial gifts he did in secret, putting it in through the window, fell into a sock that was hung up to dry. And so the concept of putting up, so there's just all kinds of things about the Christmas story. Um, that fit in, and then of course Christmas carols and going caroling and all that. So Christmas, if you're going to take in all of it, or even start trying to do it, takes so much time. And so that's why uh, uh, I start my Christmas study fairly early, 
uh, to try and get into the idea behind what this is, because it's all about, and, and then there's a, I don't know how you've ever seen the, the movie Christmas with a capital C, which is based on a, on, on a song by Go Fish, and carries with it the idea of the modern culture where we, instead of saying Merry Christmas because we don't want to offend anybody, we say Happy Holidays. And so you can't have a happier reason for a holiday than Jesus coming and be born. And so that's, uh, but anyway, if you've never seen that it, you know, or heard that song, it's a very interesting thing. And, and it's a movie was made on it, Christmas with a capital C, uh, about celebrating, celebrating Jesus. That's the reason we, we do it is because of Christ. And so there's all that, that uh, fantastic, uh, beautiful things about Christmas, and sometimes it gets overwhelmed by the, the buying and shopping and, and just the hassle and all that kind of stuff, and takes away from the fact that we're celebrating Jesus coming to earth and who he was and what he, what he was going to do through a, a virgin named Mary. So I want to look at, at just a little bit of that and kind of get started this morning and then bring it to our celebration of the communion service because the end result of what Jesus coming to do, we celebrate when we take communion together and take a, a, a simple uh, cracker and juice or, or whatever, a symbol of what Jesus did when he came and, and why he came. So I titled the, the, the sermon, by the way, Have Yourself a Merry, Humble Christmas. And if you notice, it's M-A-R-Y. And by the way, the, uh, there's a, a rock and roller from time past, Marilyn McCoo, who was uh, part of the, the Motown and all that kind of stuff. And she does a, a thing of, of this song. I have a CD, and, and it's mostly Christian carols. Christmas carols, but she also does have yourself a merry little Christmas, if you know the song. And then, but I like what she does, and she's the only one I've ever do this. When when she comes to the part, we will be together, if fate allows. And she says, if the Lord allows. When she sings it, it just brings a whole new connotation to the song. So that's kind of where the title comes from. But it's Mary because I want to end up with a little bit about Mary and why she is so important. And some, some religious things have made her maybe too important, but I like what Jack Hayford has, has said. I've got a couple of books that he wrote about Christmas. One is The Mary Miracle, that sometimes Protestants take it too little because she is going to be, as we see, the pattern and example of having new birth born in our lives. She is the example that is set, and yet we're going to look at the reason I say humble because we're going to look at what she said and then and after we look at what Jesus did so he can come to be born, which we have a symbol of here in this measure, in this in the in, in the manger. So let's look at that. We'll put up the first scripture. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of all men. And we won't get into the, the real long theological stuff behind that about what that word logos means because that's the word that is, is translated word. But it was, it was the energy or the thing behind everything that exists. And so the Christmas story is simply about, about and then we'll go to the next one, how the word became flesh. So you got to take an understanding that first four verses that says Jesus is responsible for everything that exists. Amen. Colossians, the second chapter, says the same thing, and he is the power that holds everything together. Right. And then in, in Hebrews, the first couple of verses, he is the, the power of the word that makes things exist. It's his power and energy that does that. And then it says, and I just want to relay here quickly, I don't want to get too wrapped up in it, but you've heard me talk about uh, Canis Majoris, uh, and if you, if you know about that, it's the biggest star that they had found, and by the way, if you Google now, they have found a bigger star than Canis Majoris. Uh, but anyway, just so that I want to, un to understand who this Jesus is and what it means that he became flesh, is he is the one that brought everything into existence. We saw that. And by the way, our little pipsqueak sun, which will burn us, 
We don't get enough of it in the winter, at least I don't. Uh, it will burn us in the summer. Is 93, you can, you can put 933 million Earths inside of our sun. That's how big it is in relationship to our Earth. Okay? And, and I'll relate that the way Louis Gigby does. If the Earth were a golf ball, then you could put 930 million Earths were golf balls inside of it, and that's enough golf balls to fill a large school bus completely full. That's how big our sun is. And our sun is nothing compared to this star Canis Majoris. Canis Majoris is so big that if the Earth were a golf ball, you could put seven quadrillion Earths inside of Canis Majoris. That's enough golf balls to cover the state of Texas 22 inches deep in golf, ball, golf balls to get seven quadrillion golf balls. And now they know that Canis Majoris is not the biggest star there is. They found a bigger one. Jesus, as the word, the Logos, is responsible for breathing Canis Majoris and millions and billions of stars in billions of galaxies that we look at, at the sea and now we've got new telescopes out there doing it. This is that word that became flesh and dwelt among us. How did he become flesh? He didn't come and with some great arrival somewhere in, in some great grand display. He came as a baby spawned by the Holy Spirit in, maybe in, in Mary's womb. So I want to look at just a little bit about how this happened for this creator of everything that exists, creative agent of Father God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who brought everything into existence. How in the world, in all infinity, did he become a baby that needed to be nursed Diapers changed, needed, needed to be taught, needed to, to help someone help him to get started to walk. How did that happen? And why did it happen? Why was that necessary? So he's a creative word of every, everything that exists. How did he become flesh? Let's go to Philippians, the second chapter. And I, uh, we'll come back to this, but I want to, to just notice how Paul starts this verse. He says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And so what he's setting this all up is saying that as followers of Jesus, we need to think like him. Because let this mind means this way of thinking be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God means that he was, he was God. The God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit did not consider Robert to be equal with God, and, and that can be translated, did not consider all those divine powerful things as something he needed to reach out and grasp and not let go of. But made himself of no reputation, meaning that he didn't stop being God, but he gave up all the divine prerogatives of being the creative agent of the universe, this one who could just breathe out galaxies, he emptied himself of that, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a slave. It's translated bondservant, but it's the same word that can be translated in other places as a slave, and then coming in the likeness of men spawned by the Holy Spirit to make the other half of the DNA, because they didn't want any sin connected with it through Adam's side, so it's going to be done by the Spirit with Mary's half of the DNA to make this single cell embryo that's going to develop into this baby Jesus. And so how did it happen? Because he humbled himself, gave up all those divine prerogatives that he had that were his by nature, set them aside and like John has preached and taught us over and over again in John, when you're looking at what Jesus does in the miracles of the Gospel of John, he does them by the will of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because he's doing it as an example for us that that's the only way that we can live. 
and have eternal life. And he set that perfect example of doing that. And then it says, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so that's what this is all about. And if we have time, I want to share one song with you by Go Fish that, that points to where the whole idea of him coming and doing this was so he can end up on a cross. Because it's the only way you and I can be saved. It's the only way that our destiny is changed from H-E double toothpicks to eternity with Jesus Christ in God's presence forever in a realm we cannot even imagine. Because that's what was destined to have happened to him. He was going to come and die on the cross. Uh, so Paul is now setting that up for us, seeing what Jesus has done. Remember how he started this, let this way of thinking be in you. Oh. Oh. So it's not about the proud boys. It's not about the proud girls. It's not about the proud of pride of anything. It's about humbling ourselves before God. And that is the only, the only way, and that's what we're going to look at, is the only way to have eternal life. And the interesting thing about it is it's such a, a, an opposite type of thing. And by the way, uh, we have to be careful that when we look at what we need to do, that somehow then we're miserable, unimportant, and we're worthless. And yet we are so worthwhile that Jesus came there and died there. That's how important every individual is to God. He loved the whole world. Every end of, but on the other hand, you can't go the other side. Well, I'm just going to be what I'm going to be because that's what God has made me. No, unless you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we are not being what God intended us to be because he has new life for us. And just like new life was born into Mary, we are born again when we humble ourselves before God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I cannot save myself. My thinking is warped. It is wrong. Even when I think I'm doing right, then I'm setting myself up in a prideful way. And that is sin. And that's where sin started, by the way, and came from. The concept of pride. Of what I can be and what I'm going to be. And it led to sin. And that's in all of us by nature as children of Adam and Eve. So he humbled himself and became obedient upon death, even the death of the cross. And by the way, that scripture has gone and said, and because of this, God has highly exalted him. You want to be exalted? Humble yourself and become a servant. And by the way, that is going to be true, and we're going to look at Mary here next, but I just want to share something that it, how it relates to everyday life. Uh, we are soon going to be coming up on the anniversary of of the, what caused us to be in the entry of, of World War II. It, it's just a few days away. Um, and then after the struggle of that and, and then getting and being in, in league with, with other nations who were fighting that type of, of tyranny that war had been declared on, that eventually, three and a half years later, a general is going to set up a plan along with all of his advisors and whatever to plan the invasion of Normandy and Europe to begin to push the tide of evil, evil back. And that general was Dwight Eisenhower. And one of the most important things that I think I've ever learned about him was that when that was all set up, before they ever made the landings on June 6, 1944, was he wrote a speech that was to be given to everybody, to all over the world at that time, that if it failed, and there was a good possibility that it would. And if you read some of that, you'll know that some of those advance and some of those troops, the first ones that went ashore, nearly the whole entire group was, was basically wiped out. And yet it was successful. But Eisenhower wrote a speech that if it didn't work and they had to withdraw, he wrote a speech and said, the entire blame is mine. I'm the one to blame. 
not anybody else because he knew he was a servant. And by the way, military, and thanks to all the veterans that have served, the military only works through the idea of servanthood. People obeying orders. And what Eisenhower knew and others know, of course, it's done by those common soldiers, privates, sergeants, and all the rest of them who follow the orders. And so the example is set for us, but our human nature, we don't see that so easily. We always want to get to where somehow it's about me. And that's where being a servant is what brings us to what I was going to finish up with. Once we give ourselves to servanthood like Jesus did, and it goes on to say, and God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow. And not that that's what we want, that sometimes somebody's going to bow for us, but no, our concept is if we are servants, they will bow before Jesus because we have shared the word of truth and life, and they understand it like we understand, hopefully, and live that out in our life. We never stop being servants. You know, John says of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Isn't it interesting that the conqueror, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is a lamb? And then it goes on to say, as Hayford pointed out in a book I'm reading, that it, he talks about his flock. And, and, and you, how he's the shepherd of the flock. Well, guess what? That means we're all sheep. Oh, wait a minute, I want to be a warrior. I want to be, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I grew up raising sheep, and believe me, I understand the concept of that, what that means. They're not necessarily the smartest animal that ever lived. Um, we have to protect them when they're, if they're not shorn, you have to protect them. They don't get in water and drown themselves if they haven't been shorn and they're still wearing the heavy wool. But at any rate, the concept there is we never stop being sheep. We're his sheep because he never stops being the Lamb of God. You can read the book of Revelation and it keeps, keeps repeating that title of him. And yes, he is still king of kings. And he comes on a white horse and all that kind of stuff. But he's still the Lamb of God and we are still his flock. And we're also his children. We never stop being children because Jesus said when he points to a child of such is the kingdom of heaven. Because we're always in the learning, maturing process of following Jesus. There's always the next day. There's always the next scripture that will be illuminated to us. There's always the next responsibility that he will bring to us as his servants to share the gospel or to experience what God has for us. So it's just interesting how all this fits in. So now let's go to the next scripture. And you can get into to the Gospel of Luke and, and read the whole story about this girl named Mary, uh, probably of a poor family, uh, growing up, learning the customs of what it means to be a Jewish girl. And then an angel comes and, and visits her, and his name is Gabriel, and he tells her what she has been chosen for. And, uh, you know, she just, she is in shock and awe. And by the way, every time an angel comes, they normally have to tell each one of us, don't be afraid because we're not normally in, in accustomed to seeing angels. Uh, I haven't seen one, but I, I can only imagine in my own sinful, selfish humanity what it would be like to, to have an angel show up. But Mary did that and anyway told her what was going to happen and, and and she says, well, I'm not married yet. And, Jesus, and the angel says, don't worry about that. What's going to happen to you is going to come from God. And by the way, that is what the Mary miracle that Hayford points out is our salvation does not come by us, but it comes to us by the Holy Spirit. And the very same Holy Spirit that's going to cause this conception in her is what brings us new life. It doesn't come for us, but it comes to us to grow inside of us and be experienced. And anyway, Mary's response is, and this is carrying on this concept of, of Mary and the hum humility. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, the slave of God. Let it be done, let it be done to me according to your word. And maybe in, in a couple of weeks, 
I'll bring out something Pastor David shared with us quite a few years ago about that process that Mary has. There's about six things in that section of, of the Gospel of Luke that shows about Mary, but the most important one was, she says, Behold, here I am, I'm yours. I belong to you. It's all going to be done by your power, and I'm going to, I'm going to give myself to that, give myself to that, to you. And so that's what happens to her. She's a slave. Confession, let it be done to me according to your word. Now, what does that mean for us? And I want to put up the next scripture, and then we'll get ready, start getting ready for communion. This before that section of scripture in, in chapter 2 where it talks about how Jesus emptied himself. He addresses the church at Philippi so he can be addressing us. Followers of Christ if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior. And this is where humility comes into shoe leather in everyday practice. That's what Paul says with Jesus and Mary as our example. And this is what he tells them. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, it's not about me. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than him or herself. Is that easy to do? Not at all. Because we have a tendency to compare other people to ourselves. But at any rate, Esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interests. Yes, I've got things I've got to take care of just to live here on planet Earth. Right now, taking care of the kids. Some of you are doing that, or grandkids, or whatever. But also for the interest of others. It's always about, and I like the way Linda used to teach it, about joy. Jesus and others in you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. And that always works for our entire life. It never changes. So now I want to go to uh, Corinthians and look at this. And let me just explain this before we listen. I want to share one more song with you, then we'll do communion. But this is in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, where the whole concept of, of our taking communion comes from and what it means and, and why we do it and how we're supposed to do it, but what our mindset is supposed to be when we do it. And what the Corinthian people were doing, they, were, they had been divided by classes, rich, poor, male, female, slaves, free, whatever. It was just all over in the city of Corinth. And as Pastor John had taught us when he taught Corinthians, uh, and I never forget, Linda wrote a paper on, on it when she was in, in Bible college, and I still have it. But to be called a Corinthian meant that you were open to Las Vegas, anything in it that's bad times a million. That was what it meant to be a Corinthian. And so people were being saved out of this lifestyle coming into the church, but they were bringing some of the baggage with them as they came instead of leaving it behind. And you will find that, that the 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 rich did not want to have communion with the poor because back then they would celebrate an entire dinner together. Well, the rich would bring all the wealthy stuff that they had, but the poor might bring a pot of beans. That's all they had, or rice. And so they didn't want to, they didn't want to have them having the filet mignon when all they could bring was rice. And I'm, I'm exaggerating, but that's basically what, was, what it was all about. And then they were coming and trying to celebrate Jesus emptied himself to die on a cross with that attitude towards each other. And so that's why Paul writes this. And that goes back to that, you know, esteem others better than yourselves and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that we're not going to stand for righteousness because we need to. But we need to understand that the only reason maybe we are in the place where we are and the other people haven't made it yet is because of God's grace working in us, not of us. And that same grace is open to them and maybe they just need our help understanding and prayer to come past that. But it can't happen if we have this division and this, this way of dividing. So anyway, that's what set this up. And so Paul says, let a person examine themselves and do all that. And by the way, that doesn't mean that somehow we do enough good stuff that we're worthy to take communion. 
The only reason we're worthy to take communion is because of God's grace through his son, Jesus Christ. But it means we need to examine and see if our attitudes are right and say, okay, you know, before we take communion, get that out of me, Father. I just give it to you. I want this to be a celebration. All of us together who know Jesus to be a celebration, an act of worship, an act of caring, an act of prayer, and an act of fellowship, which is what communion means. The idea of being together because we're one in the body of Christ. And so that brings up this thing, then Paul says, for if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged, but when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord and may not be condemned in the world. That's why God sometimes has to smack us on the back of the head and say, wake up! My grace and my love is a whole lot bigger than you're letting it be because of your attitude. And then I like what it says in one of the notes that when you come to communion, the communion table, you come with humility because I cannot buy my salvation or earn it. Even after I accept Jesus as my Savior, it is an act of grace my entire life till I go be with him. It's confession. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me for having a selfish attitude or whatever. And worship. And then we are strengthened in him. And that's the whole idea of communion and fellowship is to be strengthened together in Christ. So that we can live out being the body of Christ in unity. Sharing the God. Standing for what is right, yes. Vocalizing what is right, yes. But doing it in love. Knowing the only thing that separates us from a person who may be the most horrendous person in the whole world is the grace and love of God. We are lost without that. And so that's what the communion table is supposed to be. JC, if you, I, I'm going to close with that. If you have not accepted Jesus, do that as Lord and Savior. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I give myself to you. And then also when we take communion, it says, let a man examine himself and say, God, just open it up to me, but I give myself to you. And take communion in faith. That his body was broken for us, his blood was given for the new covenant.